It's really important that people understand that all dream figures are not created equal. Some of them are about as alive and active as a potted plant. But then there's other dream figures who you can just see by the light in their eyes and their movements that they're very aware, they're very knowledgeable. And in fact, Adam, I've occasionally been talking to a dream figure and mentioning, wow, this is really a stable, lucid dream. And then the knowledgeable dream figure looks at me and says, this is not a lucid dream. Is this a dream? Seems like an easy question to answer, but is it really? If it was, then every night we could all be flying through the sky like superheroes, catching up with our favorite historical figures, seeking out answers to our most meaningful questions. The list goes on. My name is Adam Cotton, and I love to talk about lucid dreaming, dreams in which you are aware that you are dreaming. Yeah, I've got a few dream skills, but they could use some refining, like Luke in the first Star Wars movie when he meets Obi-Wan. In order to polish those up and learn more about this enigmatic state of consciousness, I'm going to find the explorers and professionals on the frontiers of this field, pick their brains, and bring you along for the ride. So, buckle up my friend, it's time to step through the looking glass into the magical and mysterious world of dream logic where things are not always as they seem, and where the sky is just the beginning. What's up, dreamers? Welcome to Is This a Dream? A Lucid Dreaming Podcast, Episode 4. A little housekeeping up front. You can find the show notes for this episode and others at Is This a Dream Podcast? Dot com. And you can also follow us at facebook.com slash is this a dream podcast and at is this a dream underscore on Instagram. So here's the deal. I'm going to let you in on my plan for the maiden voyage of this podcast. I'm putting out around seven episodes for this first run and then probably letting it float for a bit at that point. It takes a pretty hefty amount of time and effort to produce each of these. And as of now, I am a one-man team doing this for the love of it. AKA, there are no sponsors. You can do the math there. Maybe someday, if it strikes a chord with enough folks, I can make it my full-time job and keep it going. I'm game for that. But in the meantime, let me know if you are enjoying the podcast and want to hear more. There's a contact link on the website, isthisdreampodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you. There's also a button there to donate via PayPal if the spirit moves you. Or another way you can help out is by leaving a review on whatever app you're listening with, which will help other like-minded people to find it. Or just listen and enjoy. That's totally fine too. Hello there, people of Earth and other planets or dimensions if you happen to be tuning in. Greetings from the great state of Texas. It was a real treat putting this episode together. If you listened to the last one with mirror artist Nikki Alice, you might recall us mentioning lucid dreaming author Robert Wagner quite a lot. And for good reason. His contributions to the world of lucid dreaming are substantial. I was pretty stoked when he said, sure, I'll do your podcast. That doesn't really exist yet. In this conversation, we cover a range of subjects, including interacting with the larger awareness, different types of dream figures, going to the area with the most energy in the dream, mutual lucid dreaming, precognitive lucid dreams, dream telepathy, reality creating principles, lucid living, overcoming limiting beliefs, and resolving health issues in dreams to mention a few. I think everyone will get something from this episode, no matter if you're still trying to have your first lucid dream or have been doing it for years. I edited the conversation in some spots for time. All right, here we go.
I am so excited. My guest today is none other than Robert Wagner. Robert is one of the preeminent lucid dreaming experts in the world, a Jedi level lucid dreamer in his own right, and just a positively good guy. He's the author of two fantastic and extremely deep books on the subject Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self, and Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple, both of which have permanent spots on my nightstand. He is the former president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, an international speaker, dream coach, and co-editor of the very cool quarterly publication, The Lucid Dream Exchange. You can find Robert and all kinds of great lucid dreaming resources online at lucidadvice.com and also dreaminglucid.com, where you can download all 71 issues of The Lucid Dreaming Exchange for free if you like, although... If you do actually do that, maybe consider donating something to the cause because as far as I can tell, this magazine is a complete labor of love. Although I'm almost certain he wouldn't remember, I first met Robert in 2001 at the annual International Association for the Study of Dreams conference in Santa Cruz, where I'm pretty sure I carried his luggage and showed him to his room. At the time, I was part of a student team that spent the better part of the year organizing the conference. I remember thinking that if there were a lucid dreaming Olympics, this thing had a good chunk of the team here, including this guy. We've corresponded on and off through the years about lucid dreaming, and he's always been more than generous to write me back and offer feedback on whatever questions or mysteries I seem to be pondering. If you are familiar with Robert's work, you will know that he is endlessly curious, extremely positive, and all about the exploration of the outer limits of these realms. Also, ultimately, he's a strong believer in the power of lucid dreaming as a path for spiritual growth and development, leading to further interconnection with fellow humans and all other forms of consciousness. He sometimes refers to himself as a dream anthropologist, which honestly sounds like the coolest job in the world, kind of like the Indiana Jones of Dreamland. Speaking of which, ladies and gentlemen, dreamers of the world, it is with great honor that I introduce to you and welcome to the show, the one, the only, Mr. Robert Wagner. Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for taking the time to come on the podcast to chat about lucid dreaming. I've been looking forward to this a lot and have worked hard to distill the many, many things I'd like to ask you down to a manageable chunk of podcast-friendly material. All right. That's great. So, as you may have heard, this podcast is called Is This a Dream? It's like a branded reality check. So, Robert, can you please double check right now? Is this a dream? And please talk us through your thought process. You know, it's always a good idea to do reality checks if you ever have an idea that you might be dreaming. And for me, my favorite reality check at the moment is just uh, taking my finger, my index finger, and pulling it with my other hand to see if it'll grow. Whenever that thing grows, I know this is a dream. Mm. And since it's not growing right now, I'm pretty sure this is waking physical reality. All right. We're pretty sure we're in waking physical reality. So I think of you through all the different work you do, kind of like this eagle perched on a mountain overlooking the various realms of the lucid multiverse. What going-ons or explorations currently interest you the most? Boy, um, I, I just have a great love for lucid dreaming, and kind of my mission in life is just to help everyone see the greater potential of lucid dreaming, whether it's for emotional healing or for physical healing or interacting with what I call the awareness behind the dream, which is basically a person's unconscious mind. I just find all of that endlessly fascinating. But for me myself, I just continue to explore. I have my own questions that I ask the larger awareness, and I've had some just profoundly trippy lucid dreams. In fact, some of them are so profound, they're almost hard to write up after I come out of the lucid dream and wake up. We really don't have words for some of the experiences at the deeper levels. Yeah, I wonder, especially with someone on such an advanced level as yourself, that must happen more and more as you go along, I would imagine. And, you know, it's funny because I have a question later about dream journaling I was going to ask you. Uh, But yeah, I'm curious how you deal with having dreams that are on that level at a certain point and how you process that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
it's one of those things to really develop a good memory. Um, and the first thing you got to think when you wake up is, what was I just dreaming? So you can't look at your cell phone, can't do anything like that. You got to immediately focus on what was I just dreaming and try to piece the dreams back together again. And also one thing that lucid dreamers find that in a very long lucid dream, one that goes on and on, you know, for 10, 20 minutes, oftentimes it's hard to remember the entire lucid dream. And so you really have to stop within the lucid dream and begin to recall, okay, what happened in the last four minutes and kind of get the biggest elements of it because in a really a long lucid dream, it's really hard to recall uh, the early parts of it. Uh, the last five or ten minutes, you probably can, but the early part's more difficult. So along the way, it just helps to develop a good sense of memory. Mm. A fascinating subject you talk in depth about, and we've corresponded a bit regarding, is dream figures. Here's a quote from Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self. As experienced lucid dreamers will tell you, dream figures exist in much greater complexity and variety than most dream theorists imagine, end quote. These figures seem to run the gamut from basic thought forms and symbolic representations to what you call independent agents. Here's where things get really interesting. These independent agents seem to be completely at home in the dream state, can have their own agendas, can possess knowledge that you do not have, demonstrate purposeful action, and initiate high-level conversations, or, in other words, often seem smarter and more knowledgeable than the dreamer. Sometimes they will act as guides and teachers. I have had many personal experiences with these figures. Often I have used your thought forms disappear command to root them out, which is an effective but strange thing to do. Strange in that, in my experience, sometimes it seems to have a sort of Frodo putting on the ring-like effect to it. Oftentimes for me, when using this command in a public dream setting with, say, 80 people present, only half or less disappear. Usually, some remaining dream figures will be visibly annoyed by the disruption, but if I ask, there are always at least one to four others who seem interested in interacting, or maybe even seem to know me and want to guide me somewhere or tell me something. Due to the unexpected high number of figures still present after using the command, I often experience this sense of excitement mixed with a feeling of, what the hell is going on here? If consistently only half or less of these figures are part of my own dream world, who or what are the rest of these beings? Where are they coming from and where am I exactly? Have you had or heard of similar experiences as far as the surprisingly large proportions of non-thought forms present in dream crowds? And what is your current point of view on this general subject? You know, it's really important that people understand that all dream figures are not created equal. There are just different types of dream figures. Some of them are totally non-responsive. They're about as alive and active as a potted plant, and you'll, you won't learn anything from them. But then there's other dream figures who you can just see by the light in their eyes and their movements, that they're very aware, they're very knowledgeable. And in fact, Adam, I've occasionally been talking to a dream figure and mentioning, wow, this is really a staple lucid dream, or wow, this lucid dream is really going on a long time. And then the knowledgeable dream figure looks at me and says, this is not a lucid dream. And so it's suggesting that we're in a different state of awareness. And uh, normally in those experiences, I'll think, oh, yeah, I can't remember how I became lucid. I just started out aware and took it from there. Wow. So again, you know, this issue of independent agents and the dream figures who are not thought forms, the ones who don't disappear when you shout out, now all thought forms must disappear. It really makes you wonder, you know, where do they come from? Where is this space, whether it's a psychological space or a mental space or a spiritual space, where is this space where this stuff is happening? So again, that's a wonderful quest, uh, an incredible thing to explore. Mm. There's a dream navigation technique you recommend in Lucid Dreaming Plain and Simple, where the idea is to go to the area of most sensed energy, positive or negative, in order to seek out healing, education, and resolve inner struggles. 
This is such a simple but powerful method that can clear the way to more deeper and transformative work. And anyone with a little experience and stability can try it. It is kind of a cousin of the unlimited intent technique you suggest. Can you expand a little on this idea? Right. You know, um, I do hope everyone will think about this as kind of making it a primary directive. In your lucid dreams, always go to the area of the most energy. And so, for example, when you become lucidly aware, there might not really be much energy going on. And so then you kind of have a green light to do whatever you want to do. But here's an example of the area of the most energy and why I was happy that I followed my rule. So um, I found myself in an old phone booth out in the middle of the prairie in a small town in Kansas at night. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me, what am I doing in a phone booth in a small town in Kansas at night? And I became lucidly aware. And instead of uh, just flying away or or dreaming up uh, something to do, all of a sudden I realized that there's all this light coming out of this building over here. And so because I always go to the area of the most energy, I decided, okay, I'll go over there and find out what's going on. And as I get closer, I realize it's a church with the front doors open, and there's a bunch of people in there. And still, as a lucid dreamer, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to find out what's going on here. Seems a lot of energy. And so I step up to the front door, and I look down at the very front, and there at the very front, I see an open casket. And at that moment, I think, okay, something's going on here. And so I go down to the front of the church, past all the people, look in the open casket, And there's a good friend of mine. And I look at him and his eyes are open. And I say, hey, um, what does this mean? Does this mean you're gonna die in like a year or two? And my friend goes, oh no. And I go, well, does this mean like you're gonna die in like five or 10 years? And he goes, oh no. And I couldn't figure out, you know, why he's looking at me and kind of smiling while he's laying in this open casket in the middle of a church in my lucid dream. Anyway, um, I think about a few things and decide to wake up. In the morning, I get an email from my friend, and he says, Robert, guess what? I'm getting married. And so my friend, the single guy, who was now dying. His single life was over. It was dead and gone. (laughs) And now his new life as a married guy was going to begin. But I wish I had asked him, and this is another good rule besides uh, go to the area of the most energy. The next good rule is always ask an open-ended question. So if I would have asked him a question like, so tell me, what are you doing here? Or why are you in this casket? If I would have asked him a much more open question than does this mean you're going to die in a year or two, uh, I probably would have learned in the lucid dream what he was going to be telling me the next morning. Uh, when he sent me an email unexpectedly. But the area of the most energy, really what it's about, Adam, it's about the lucid dreamer realizing that the lucid dream contents are created by something larger than you, larger than your ego awareness. And so when there's something going on, it's like your larger self is trying to point out to you, hey, check it out. Look at what's going on here. You know, it might be a wedding party. It might be a celebration. It might be God knows what. But you owe it to yourself to go check it out, figure out what's going on, and see if that connects to your waking life somehow. Mm, That's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. There's an old song that everybody probably knows called I'll See You in My Dreams, which... uh, is my segue to the next subject that consistently blows my mind, mutual lucid dreaming, which I find to be endlessly fascinating as something to ponder and attempt to dabble in. I've cobbled together a sort of hybrid quote here from Lucid Dreaming Gateway to the Inner Self's chapter on the topic, which if you're interested in this sort of thing and haven't read this book, do yourself a favor and get it. Here's the quote. I believe that given the opportunity, experienced lucid dreamers with the proper scientific protocol and circumstance will objectively prove the reality of mutual lucid dream interactions. Mutual dreaming indicates that some dreams may possess elements of a consensus reality. In effect, any evidence for mutual dreaming advances the idea of the dream state as an alternate reality. 
When demonstrated, such experiences could begin to revolutionize traditional views of dreaming and the dreaming state, end quote. You go on to talk about several scenarios and examples, one of which being that, quote, many experienced lucid dreamers can provide examples of meeting another lucid dreamer in the dream space, conversing and interacting, yet the other lucid dreamer comes from outside their circle of acquaintance, end quote. I actually had a lucid dream recently that falls into this category that I wanted to share with you here. At one point, While lucid, I encounter a female lucid dreamer, who I do not know, talking to a group of people in a small room, all seated. She's a 20 or 30-something gal, with long brown hair, attractive, confident, and collected. I take a seat to her left. She's talking about how, when she encounters other dreamers who are lucid in the dream space, she makes this decision whether or not to talk with them. She seems to be very aware, sharp, and alert. I excitedly tell her that it's actually kind of unusual for me to be lucid and stable like this. I ask her if she thinks there's some sort of shared dream space, using a hand gesture where I bring the open fingers of both of my hands together interlocking them, and if she believes that's normal. She says yes in a way that seems to imply that I'm stating the obvious. So Robert, from what you've said, Uh, and we talked a little about this earlier, it seems that most experienced lucid dreamers, including this one I recently met in Dreamland, seem to agree that this is an obvious conclusion, that we are just not able to prove objectively yet. There seems to be some sort of extremely responsive shared alternate reality or alternate dimensional space where all sorts of consciousnesses coexist, our shadow parts, higher parts, thought forms, the so-called astral bodies of the living, the deceased, extraordinary beings, and hyper-intelligent meta-awarenesses that we don't totally understand. And that's just the short list. Add to the top of that the fact that this is a place that seems to coexist and have a relationship with our waking physical reality, and we can freely access it from any time or place. What's going on here, Robert? Wow. There really is something truly remarkable about some of these lucid dreams, and I know it upsets the ego because the ego just wants to stay focused in the here and the now, in the physical, and what it can confirm with its senses and all. But there really seems to be something going on. An example in my life, about five years ago, um, one morning I wake up and I see an email from a young woman, and she tells me that She's out taking a gap year. Uh, She's originally from Canada, but at that time she is down in Nicaragua or Costa Rica. And she said, last night, in the middle of the night, uh, she became elusively aware and met somebody who claimed that he was Robert Wagoner. (laughs) And she said, I don't know any Robert Wagoner but he said he was there to teach me more about lucid dreaming. And we had a really heavy duty discussion on lucid dreaming, this woman and the Robert Wagoner dream figure. And so she said when she woke up in the morning, she decided to Google Robert Wagoner lucid dreamer. And she was stunned to (laughs) see that here's a guy who's written two books and is kind of a world expert on lucid dreaming. And she said, in fact, You even look like the guy, you know, your images online even look like the guy who I met with, except the guy who I met with, uh, he had a little bit more gray in his hair and and was a little bit older than some of those photos, which was the case. Anyway, you wonder how these connections occur. I mean, this woman didn't know me from anybody, had never heard of me. She was just kind of one of your average lucid dreamers who played around and had fun with it. And so after we corresponded a little bit, I told her, I said, look, I'm going to send you both copies of my book. So give me your address back in Canada. And she said, well, we're not going to be back for three or four months. And so I'll give you the address of my boyfriend's mom. And here's the address and send it. And she'll give it to me when I return. Here's the crazy thing that happened, Adam. So I went to Amazon.ca, the Canadian Amazon and I ordered my two books and had them shipped to the address that she told me. So this is like January, February. All of a sudden, in April, I get an email from Amazon Canada that they're sending my books. 
three months later, they sent my books, you know, which is so weird because normally they send them immediately and you get them in two days or whatever. So it was like the books waited until this young woman was going to be back in Canada before they actually physically shipped. It's just one of those kind of bizarre things that makes you wonder mm. how does this all occur. But I'll tell you, one way that people can play around with this idea of mutual lucid dreaming is something relatively simple, and it's called dream telepathy. So what you have to do is find someone who's really into dreaming, and you just make a plan that on one particular night, you'll send something to them, and that night they're to dream about whatever you're sending them. So it might be a photo, it might be a piece of art, it might be an object, it might be whatever. And oftentimes if you begin to play dream telepathy back and forth, you'll realize that you're sometimes having some incredible hits, and on other times you're picking up information about what was being sent. I remember a good friend of mine in Holland, uh, Suzanne, she and I used to do dream telepathy. We did it every week for about a year and a half. And I'll tell you what happened. At the end of it, we began to wonder, could you send music in dream telepathy? And so we talked about it, and so she said, okay, I'll send you some music tomorrow night, and you in the morning tell me what it is. And I want to tell you what happened. That night, I began to dream of electronic rave music going through my head, this horrible, just reoccurring electronic <laughs> rave music, just over and over, these horrible notes that were just being played over and over. I was so pissed off when I woke up in the morning, you know, I immediately jumped on my computer and wrote Suzanne an email, you sent me rave music. And, and of course, uh, she laughed and she sent me the little uh, clip from YouTube of rave music that she had sent. Wow. And so here's what I did. So the next week it was my turn. So I thought, oh, Here's what I'll do. I'll send her the Dutch national anthem because she's from Holland. <laughs> and so I keep watching, focusing on the Dutch national anthem, a little clip on YouTube, and I'll focus on it for about five minutes, and then I'll leave it alone. Then I'll come back an hour later, focus on it again. Imagine that she's receiving it. That night, she dreams that she and her father are walking to the local football stadium there in Holland, and she's thinking, my dad hates football. Why are we going to a football stadium? And all of a sudden, in the dream, as she walks into the football stadium, suddenly the Dutch national anthem begins to play. So she totally picked up that I was sending wow. the Dutch national anthem. But the crazy thing was, as we went deeper, sometimes she would send me music from groups that I'd never heard of because she's in Europe and I'm here in the States. And the crazy thing was, I would dream about all the band members. I would know that the drummer was black and the main singer was this guy from Northern United Kingdom. And it was trippy. I would wake up, she'd tell me, oh yeah, and she would send me some information. But anyway, so what I'm trying to get into by bringing up dream telepathy is I think underlying mutual dreaming is basically the knowledge that all of us are telepathically connected and that behind all waking circumstance, there's this kind of telepathic communication going on that makes it all happen. And that's why we have weird synchronicities and strange things that are almost impossible to explain, it's because behind the scenes, at this deeper level, we're actually all connected. But anyway, you can play with it and see where it goes. That's so interesting. I think I heard you talking in another interview about a proposed Stephen LaBerge experiment where, similar to the original one, you'd have two dreamers in a sleep lab and they were doing a mutual dreaming experiment and they could both signal with their eyes when they met up in the dream space. And then, of course, you could debrief them separately afterwards just to get the separate accounts through a third party. And if everything lined up, then that would be a pretty compelling case for mutual dreaming, right? That would be one way of doing it. Um, I know in my online magazine, uh, Lucid Dreaming Experience, 
we had this young guy from Cornell. He wrote us and said, this would be a way that you could do it. If you had a headset connected with another lucid dreamer, uh, you know, by Bluetooth or whatever, that you signaled with your eyes when you were consciously aware that would cause his uh, system to, you know, start flashing red lights in the eyes of the other lucid dreamer, and then they would try to uh, meet up or pass on a secret word or something that they could both confirm in the morning. He said that he thought there were really some ways that you could bring science and technology into this to uh, increase the likelihood of it happening. Because normally what happens is one person is lucid and the other person isn't. For example, I've talked about my friend Ed Kellogg. He's a phenomenal lucid dreamer. And um, one morning he called me up and he asked me what I dreamt about that night. And so I told him the two or three dreams I recalled. And he goes, okay, that one right there. And basically the dream was pretty simple. I was sitting at a table with three other people. And so Ed goes, okay, the person across from you, you know, was that a woman who was in a blue dress and had a white rose in her cap and all this? And they go, wow, Ed, how do you know that? And he goes, don't worry about that. And so the person to your right, was that a man and he was wearing a suit and had a blue tie and all this? I go, yeah, Ed, that's right. How do you know that? And then finally Ed said, well, what about the person to your left? And I said, well, I know it's a man, but I really can't remember what he looked like. And Ed says, well, the reason you can't remember is that was me, and that's why I know what these other people looked like around this table. It was truly a phenomenal moment, but Ed was lucid in the dream, and so he could uh, get a much deeper appreciation of all the details. So when you have moments like this, it really makes you wonder, is the information just being shipped out, you know, telepathically, and then the other person gets the information and concocts the dream in accordance with what information they're receiving? Or are we actually meeting in an alternate space, you know, some quantum dream space or something like that where this activity is going on? Anyway, I think someday science will figure this out, but it, this might be one of these things that 50, 60 years from now is when it gets figured out. Yeah, it really sort of, once you experience these types of things, it just shakes your whole view of reality from the ground level up. I don't know if it's the right terminology, but there is a sense of cognitive dissonance, for lack of better term, with the sort of status quo view of reality and what's going on out there that, you know, because we live in a very materialistic, focused society that everything's focused on the physical world. And, you know, there's lots of pluses to that. You know, we've had lots of scientific breakthroughs and whatnot, but the pendulum is a little far over that way. And there's sort of a disdain in a way. I can't quite think of the right words. Uh, you know, within the scientific community, a lot of people don't want to touch this kind of stuff because they're worried about their reputations. And, you know, with the pseudoscience and new age and borderline mystical stuff, which some of could be true, but it's just there's sort of a bias. And uh, But as a lucid dreamer, once you start having these experiences, it's hard to go back to, you know, what everybody else sort of collectively thinks of as reality. Lucid dreamers sort of have a different version of that, right? Well, they definitely have an expanded version <laughs> because, because, because you begin to have these experiences and it's just, as you say, using the basic scientific material view of the world you really can't explain them but if you get an expanded view of the world uh, you realize that okay this experience happened it can't be explained by the normal rules I can't deny the experience happened and so I just have to assume that things are even more stranger than we really know and a lot of times when you listen to modern physics and quantum physicists they're very serious people, and they're doing things along the scientific uh, methodology. But sometimes I feel like they're doing much the same thing. They're showing us that what we consider reality isn't exactly the actual state of affairs, that it's actually much more curious than what we even want to admit. So I think someday uh, the blinders will come off and everyone will get it, but right now, when you have these lucid dream experiences that blow your mind, that, that's when you really realize there's something more going on. You might not be able to explain it, but there's just something more going on. 
Yeah, yeah. Once you start reading some of that quantum physics, string theory, all that kind of stuff, it sort of starts to line up in ways. You know, they're talking about. Last time I checked in, there was twelve different dimensions that quantum physicists propose, and I think maybe something about them sort of being layered like an onion in a way, which. As a lucid dreamer, that totally lines up with some of the things you experience. You know, although it might be hard to flesh all of those out, it certainly is congruent in a way with those kinds of viewpoints. We're going to take a little break here. Be back in a bit. Got a little segment queued up for you. It's segment time. Whether we are in waking physical reality, dreamland, or another state of consciousness, our level of awareness is always fluctuating. For example, during a typical day, many of us are at our most alert after having a cup of coffee in the morning. Then, after lunch, we might get sleepy and return to our tasks in an almost trance-like fashion, easily distracted and prone to daydreams. Sometimes we can move between all these states within moments. Similarly, in the dream state, our awareness can also vacillate along a broad spectrum. Lucid dream researcher and author Claire Johnson writes: Within just one minute of dreaming, we might be non-lucid, then pre-lucid, wondering if this is a dream and performing a reality check, then fully lucid, and then lose lucidity. Effortlessly lucid awareness may slide into flawed reasoning, like deciding to take a photo of something in the dream to show it to someone when you wake up. End quote.、Oh. These varying levels of lucidity have been observed and mapped out by many oneirons, but the clearest version I've seen comes from lucid dream researcher Ed Kellogg, which he calls the lucidity continuum. Starring Matthew McConaughey and Natalie Portman, coming soon to a theater near you. Okay, okay, not actually a movie yet. Kellogg's lucidity continuum is presented in Robert Wagner's book *Lucid Dreaming: Gateway to the Inner Self*. It outlines six levels of lucidity: pre-lucid, sub-lucid, semi-lucid, lucid, fully lucid, and super-lucid. Let's take a little walk through these. One. Pre-lucid, the dreamer notices an anomaly as unusual. The dream report might read: A yellow and pink flying snake smiled and winked at me while floating by. I thought that was weird. Two, sublucid, the dreamer vaguely realizes he or she dreams. The dream report might read: I opened a can of soda, and several tiny feet popped out and started dancing on my stomach. So I knew this couldn't be real. Three, semi-lucid. The dreamer knows he or she dreams, but continues to follow the dream plot with very minor adjustments. The dream report might read: I walk into the house I grew up in, and my childhood dog Tribbles is excited to see me. Then I realize Tribbles is dead, and so this must be a dream. Then mom asks if I can help set the table for dinner, so I do so and decide to go ahead and feed Tribbles while I'm at it. Four, lucid. The dreamer knows he or she dreams and realizes choices and ability to make major changes in their dream experience. The dream report might read: It's the first day of high school, senior year. I'm trying to find my first class, but realize I don't have a schedule. I have no idea where to go, and time is running out. I'm going to be late to the first class. Then I think, wait, I'm not in high school anymore. This must be a dream. To make sure I'm right, I attempt to float up into the air and am successful. Now lucid, I fly through the hallway and into the main commons area. I yell to everyone there from above. Hey. Don't worry about getting to class. This isn't real. We're in a dream. See? Watch this. And while floating, I focus a beam of energy towards the ground, causing all of my dream classmates to also float up into the air. 
Then, I make the roof disappear by mentally expecting it, and we all fly up into the sky together. 5. Fully Lucid The dreamer can recall his or her physical life and all predetermined tasks to perform and shows a high level of dream manipulating abilities. The dream report might read, Now lucid, I begin to think, Okay, now what was my mission for tonight? Oh yeah, it was to ask an open-ended question to the larger awareness. I decide to bypass what's going on in the dream, do some flying practice first with some fun aerial acrobatics and speed practice. Eventually, I come to rest on a large dramatic cloud formation, explore that for a minute, and then yell, Hey Dream, what is the most important thing for me to know right now? 6. Super Lucid The dreamer shows extremely high levels of dream manipulation and personal energy, clarity of thought, creativity, memory, and so on. The dream report might read, Now lucid, I have incredible energy, clarity, reality creation, and telekinesis abilities, which I play with for a little while. I recall that I wanted to find and have a talk with my deceased grandpa. Ignoring the dream figures and plot, I visualize and create a scene in New York City at a deli that I imagine maybe he would have frequented when he was younger. I walk in expecting to find him at the corner table, and sure enough, he is there and seems to be expecting me. I express great joy and love while we hug. We sit down and catch up, discussing many subjects. Later it becomes clear that some of the things he tells me to do or find in the waking world are inexplicably spot on. As Wagner points out, at each successive level, you find an improvement in your clarity of thought and overall awareness, end quote. And, I mentioned earlier, we can find allegories for these levels of lucidity in both our waking states of consciousness and also the different levels of awareness encountered in dream figures even all the way up to the super lucid level. In fact, experienced lucid dreamers often report coming into contact with dream figures that clearly have higher levels of awareness than they do. These extraordinary figures will sometimes help the dreamer to become more lucid, teach them things, or offer up helpful information. You can even ask them to remind you to become lucid the next time they see you in the dreaming space. Pretty cool, eh? And we are back. I wanted to ask you a bit of a cognitive question here. Okay. You've pointed out that lucid dreaming seems considerably easier for those with positive thinking and expectation habits and independent field awareness, which is a kind of fancy term for trusting yourself in most situations. Can you talk about this? And do you have any advice for those of us who maybe did not acquire these skill sets growing up and can they be learned? What's your take on that? Yeah, you know, um, there's a few things that seem to help people become better lucid dreamers. One scientific study says that this independent field experience, which is kind of a psychological term about knowing where you are in space, uh, if you have that ability you're much more likely to be a good lucid dreamer. Or that was one skill that lucid dreamers seem to have more than the average person. And I think just in general terms, to become a good lucid dreamer, you also have to have a sense of kind of positive persistence. Because when you get into lucid dreaming, you know, you might have one lucid dream a month, or one this month, and then two lucid dreams two months later, or something like that. But you still have to kind of persist at it. You still got to kind of get into the game and kind of uh, just decide that even though it doesn't happen every night, that you're going to continue to explore it and move forward with it. But, But there are some other things, I think, that really help people learn to become good lucid dreamers. And for some people, it's just being a good observer. You know, I was really fortunate. In my family, there were five of us boys And I was number five, and then my little sister came along at the end. So there are six of us kids. 
But when you're number five in the family, you do a lot of observing. You're watching your brothers, you're watching what's going on, you're kind of picking up things, you're learning things. And so the better you get at observing, I think the better you are in the dream state when you observe that, hey, something's weird here, something strange is going on, and then you realize, oh, this must be a dream. So I think if we can kind of develop those skills of just more critical awareness or more thoughtful observations, then you can learn to be a better lucid dreamer. But there's different approaches to take. But again, some of it is about just persisting along the path of lucid dreaming. It's not always easy. Sometimes people have lucid dream droughts that go on for three months or six months or whatever, but you still persist. You still keep moving forward. Mm. Robert, you are a proponent of lucid dreaming as a path for spiritual growth and development. In Lucid Dreaming Plain and Simple, you quote the famous hypnotherapist Milton Erickson, where he says, the unconscious is always listening. In the context of lucid dreaming, I think depending on the person or belief system, you can interchange the term unconscious with inner awareness, God, higher power, conscious universe, great mystery, or whatever you are comfortable with. You've gone into depth about the ideas of addressing this awareness that always seems to be there behind the dream and the amazing power of using things like unlimited intent and the idea of surrendering to the highest. I've had some experiences recently with addressing this awareness behind the dream and the responses have been consistently powerful and enlightening. Do you think things like this, which are extremely tangible and moving experiences in the lucid dream world, are in a way like missing or forgotten puzzle pieces of innate and direct spiritual access that each of us has naturally built into the core of our beings? Wow, beautiful question. I think it is one of the missing puzzle pieces. You know, um, when I was researching for my first book, um, I met somebody who told me that in ancient Greece, they were really investigating this idea of an inner self. And in fact, they'd come up with 23 different terms for the inner self. I mean, that's how deeply engaged they were with this kind of sense of an inner knowledgeable awareness. But, you know, for most of us, we grow up and, you know, maybe we'll hear about the soul or our spirit or something like that. It's not really very tangible. Normally it's associated with church or something and, you know, it's just not our thing. Uh, But when you're lucidly aware and you ignore the dream figures and you just shout out, hey, dream, show me something important for me to see. Or you ask some other question and suddenly the entire lucid dream changes. You just realize the magnitude of creativity of whatever you're contacting, whether it's your unconscious self, whether it's your larger awareness, whether it is, you know, in a sense, your soul. It's truly, utterly, awesomely fantastic. And so so I think it is kind of a missing puzzle piece because in this day and age, we have become so focused on the ego and it's like the ego is the only existent part of the self. But really, when you realize that the unconscious is always listening, when you learn in lucid dreams how to interact with this larger awareness, you realize that the ego is really a relatively small part of the bigger self, which is this unknown self, this inner self. Wow. Yeah. It's really fascinating stuff. I've played around a fair amount with various dream skills, including using your hands and having sort of light come from your hands to do different types of things and telekinesis or psychokinesis, whatever you call that, to move things around. And I noticed that it seems like these skills develop over time. And uh, I wonder your experience with that and if there's some sort of bridge in waking life where those skills sort of... I mean, obviously you probably can't move a school bus by using your hands in waking life, nor would you want to. It's probably a bad idea unless it's empty and, you know, in a vacant lot. But I just wonder sometimes about the, if there is some sort of transference or if those things are more meant for the dream world or if there's some sort of symbolic or 
real like healing stuff you can do in, in everyday life with those same skills? What your experiences with that, both from yourself and maybe what you've heard about? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Adam. Um, and, and that's something that I brought up and I probably could have explored a little bit more deeply in Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple. But in that book, we have a chapter on meditating in lucid dreams. And um, one thing that uh, Claire Johnson brings up, we ask her to write about her meditative experiences in lucid dreams. She said that after she had meditated five or six times in her lucid dreams, all of a sudden she realized that in her waking life, her meditative experience, she was getting to this deep point very quickly which is something that happens in a lucid dream. When you begin to meditate in a lucid dream, you suddenly get to a deep point very, very quickly, you know, within 30 seconds or a minute or whatever. But she said that after she had done it in lucid dreams, all of a sudden she could get to what used to take her 20 minutes of meditating to get to a certain level of depth. She realized that now it was just taking her four or five minutes. And so that's how I think that the transference is occurring that we do these activities in lucid dreams, and if we do the same activity enough, whether it's perfecting a physical skill or an ability, whether it's meditating, whether it's interacting with the larger awareness, all of a sudden we don't realize it, but we're making a clearer pathway to that goal or to whatever that is. So for example, for myself, uh, you have to realize it was back in 1985 was the first time that I interacted with my larger awareness. And so I was part of a lucid dreaming group and um, our goal was to find out what the dream figures represent. And so I, in a lucid dream, I asked the dream figure, hey, what do you represent? And instead of him responding, a voice boomed out a response from above him. And when I woke up, I thought, well, gosh, that's weird. Why didn't the dream figure respond? And so after that, I began to wonder if there is an awareness behind the dream and I would just shout out questions to the dream. Hey, dream, show me something important for me to see. And I was stunned that I got a response. But what I'm trying to say here is that as you begin to do that in your lucid dreams, you create a clearer, more direct connection to your larger awareness. And so sometimes I'll be going along and it's like, I realize that at a deeper level of my mind, I'm having a conversation. And then when I kind of wake up to it, I realize what the conversation is about. And then later in the day, my wife or somebody will tell me something that made me realize that this conversation actually connected with the real time event that was going on at the moment. So what I'm getting at is that by having this clear connection with the larger awareness, It allows you to um, intuitively pick up things more clearly, to uh, get information more directly, and have kind of a greater um, sense of connectedness than you did previously. Hmm. So that's how I think the transference occurs. Um, I don't play around in my lucid dreams with uh, moving objects with my mind too much, so I haven't achieved any telekinesis that I'm aware of yet. But I do feel like I have... uh, really increase my intuitional skills by just becoming more aware of interacting with this larger awareness in a lucid dream. Mm. Yeah, the meditating thing is fascinating. I've played around with that a little bit myself, and my experience is it's instantaneous. Uh, The depth within the lucid dream, at least, hasn't quite transferred over completely to daily life, but in the lucid dreams, I start meditating and It is like I'm instantly transported to this other uh, headspace, reality. It's pretty, all the stuff that start, I start seeing symbols and I start getting lifted into the air and taken places and it's just completely trippy. Better than drugs and you're not stuck with it for the next 12 hours, so that's definitely a plus. It seems that the healthiest and most successful paths of lucid dreamers lead one way or another to this idea of lucid living which is a sort of integration of the larger awareness and realizations one has in dreams with waking physical reality. This idea seems to bring the whole puzzle together, 
all the pieces that lucid dreamers work with will expectations focus intent beliefs the concept of the mental overlay and even certain dream skills that these things can become harmonious and bring the ego into relationship with our psychic center as john sanford puts it or as you put it to use lucid dreaming as a path for growth healing and transformation I think it's helpful for people to be able to aim high and know what is truly possible with lucid dreaming. Can you talk about this concept and how it can all come together for the dreamers out there? You know, it's, it is a very important concept, this idea of living lucidly or taking what you learn from the lucid dream state, seeing how that state works, and it works through these reality-creating principles of belief of expectation, of focus, intent, of will, and also the larger awareness. Those are the reality-creating principles uh, that anyone can play with in the lucid dream state and see how it creates the experience around you. And so when you take those ideas that you see work so well in the dream state in the unconscious mind and you bring them into your conscious awareness, and begin to manipulate your beliefs and expectations to change your experience or manipulate your focus and your intent and will to change your experience, it can be truly, truly powerful. That's why in the final chapter of my second book, Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple, I bring up a simple technique that anybody can use to see that all this is a dream. So that's kind of the first lesson if you were at a dream yoga monastery, all this a dream. And I think what the dream yoga monastery monks are trying to teach a person is all of this exists as a mental creation. All these sensory inputs are processed through the mind, through your beliefs, through your expectations, through your focus and intent. It's all connected as a mental creation. And so the technique that I have in the final chapter of my second book is simply this. Play around with a neutral belief. And so a neutral belief might be something like, a neutral belief is something you really don't think that much about. So a neutral belief might be how funny you are. So you might think, well, I'm not really funny, but I'm not totally unfunny. I'm kind of neutral. I'm kind of right there in the middle. You know, it's a neutral belief. I don't even think about it very much because I feel so neutral about it. So how funny you are might be a neutral belief. So in my technique, I tell a person, so for one minute, 10 times a day, energize that belief. Tell yourself that you're the funniest person in town, that you're the most comedic, hilarious person, that when people hear you, they just roar with laughter because you are the most funny, cleverest person out there. And just imagine people laughing at what you have to say and just bringing the house down. But just do it for a minute and then stop doing it and go back to whatever. And then an hour or two later, do it again for a minute and all. If you do this for four or five days, at the end of four or five days, you'll be at the checkout counter at the supermarket and you'll say something and everyone will burst out laughing. And you'll look around and you'll think, that wasn't even funny. That wasn't even funny. And here people are just cracking up. And then you'll be somewhere else and you'll say something to someone and they'll just howl with laughter. And you'll think, wow, that was barely funny at all. And after a while you begin to realize that by energizing this belief, by energizing this neutral belief, All of a sudden, that energy is being radiated out from you, and it's affecting the world around you. And you can see it for yourself. I remember the first time I did this, I kind of created this idea and then decided to try it out on myself to see if it really worked. I I literally stopped and I got totally choked up. I began to cry to realize how much my own beliefs were being projected out there Mm. and were affecting the responses of those around me. It really woke me up to the fact that not only do we create the dream and we, with our mind, we create the lucid dream, but also in this waking life, we're helping to create this 
through our beliefs and expectations. And so if you do this technique of energizing a neutral belief, you can watch it for yourself and you can kind of begin to wake up and live more lucidly and begin to examine your mind and take out the stuff that's not giving you what you want, the results you want, and activate the beliefs and expectations that are going to give you what you want. But anyway, it truly is trippy to explore the idea of living more lucidly by playing with the mind, by playing with the beliefs and expectations, just like you do in a lucid dream. That's so cool. And that also kind of dovetails back to the question about independent field awareness and positive thinking and expectation, because I guess as another answer to that, you can literally sort of reprogram yourself using these lucid living techniques. So if you don't originally have those things, there is a way to do it. It just takes some effort and focus and probably patience and a good amount of time, but it's possible. There's hope. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember um, when I was a kid, I used to read the books by uh, Jane Roberts, the Seth material. And there was one quote that I really liked, and it was this. Seth said, you get what you concentrate on. There's no other main rule. And when you really start to think about it, wow. you know, if you begin to concentrate on negative stuff, things going badly, dealing with nasty people, having trouble, you know, you'll just naturally gravitate towards that. That's what you're expecting. That's what you're believing is going to happen. You know, that's where your focus is. It'll become part of your experience. But when you realize, you know, that you can equally concentrate upon something else, you know, upon more constructive, more affirming uh, experiences, and you begin to observe your mind, then you can have just a total recalibration where suddenly, oh, I'm changing my life because now I'm just focusing on constructive stuff that I want to have happen. I'm believing it can happen. I'm being attracted to it. I'm being pulled towards it. And you'll just naturally go in that direction. But it's really about observing the mind. And uh, if you don't mind me uh, mentioning this, uh, this is one way that I healed myself of a hay fever allergy. Oh, please. So, so uh, you know, I live out in the Midwest, and about 10, 15 years ago, every time August and September would come around, my sinuses would get all uh, full of goop, and I'd be sneezing all the time. I could barely sleep. I could barely breathe, it felt like, some of the time. I was just miserable every time August and September came around. And, of course, people would call it hay fever or something like that, or you have an allergy and blah, blah, blah. But then, after I wrote my first book, and I realized that so much of this is connected to your beliefs and expectations, um, I decided, wait a second, this thing about hay fever, I didn't grow up with hay fever. I didn't have hay fever until, you know, maybe 15 years ago, up until then, never had been bothered by it. I told myself, it's a mental thing. And so what I began to do is... I focused on what is it that I want to achieve. You know, I know that I hate hay fever, but that's not a goal. You know, hating something isn't a goal. Oh, my goal is that I wanted to breathe easily and naturally Mm. uh, throughout the year. And so every time I began to think of hay fever, I'd say, oh, no, this year it's going to be different. This year I breathe easily and naturally. And every time I see a TV commercial and pollen counts are high and hay fever and blah, I say, oh no, not me, not me. This year I'm going to breathe easily and naturally. That first year, I would say I reduced the symptoms about 60, 70%. Wow. The second year, 90% of the symptoms were gone. The year after that, 95%. Now I don't even think about hay fever. Oh my gosh. I made it go away by changing my beliefs and expectations. But it's not enough to hate something and try to ignore it. You have to decide what it is that you want. And what I wanted was to breathe easily and naturally. That was the belief that I was energizing. That's what I was focusing on. And so it totally changed things around. But so often people bring up health issues You can resolve health issues in the lucid dream state. A lot of people have done it, but you can also do it in the waking state because both states are mental creations through our beliefs, expectations, focus, intent, and well, along with our larger awareness. 
we're creating our dreams, our lucid dreams, but we're also in connection with other people creating this reality that we exist in. And so when you begin to play around with your beliefs and expectations, you begin to see the kind of underlying basis of reality. Wow. That's so cool. Thanks for sharing that. I have awful hay fever myself in the springtime, <laughs> but also year round. So I'm going to try that. Uh, good. That's on my uh, lucid dream to-do list. That's so cool to hear that you achieved that. So there is hope for those types of things too. It's good stuff. Is this a dream? Is this a dream podcast? Is this a dream podcast.com? All right. It is now time for the rapid fire questions round. Are you ready, Robert? Yeah, let's go for it. What is a favorite dream inspired work of art? Could be a song, movie, book, building, painting, etc. Dream inspired work of art. Oh my gosh, I did not see this one coming. <laughs> you know what? A great one was Jasper John's um, The American Flag. He was living in a tenement in New York City. Boom, wanted to make some money as an artist, couldn't believe it, he wasn't doing it. And one night he dreams about the American flag and he wakes up and paints it. And I just thought, wow, that was so wild that a painting of the American flag would lead to prosperity and you know his discovery as an artist. So that's one that I found really incredible. So I'm not familiar with this, it already existed and he just Decided yeah, yes. Yeah. So as the story goes, uh, Jasper Jones was a struggling artist. Uh, I think he's living in like Hell's Kitchen in New York City. Mm. And uh, all these other people were becoming famous, you know, all his friends were, but his career was going nowhere. And one night he fell asleep and he dreamt of the American flag, of kind of a painting of the American flag. And when he woke up, that's what he decided to do. And all of a sudden, his career just totally went nuts. So wow, it just went out of control. That's so cool. I did not know that story. The second half of that rapid fire question is, and I know you've written and spoken in depth about this in the past. In a nutshell, a few years later, what are your feelings about the movie Inception? Well, I'm really conflicted about the movie Inception because I love the idea of using lucid dreaming to explore the nature of the collective unconscious, to explore the nature of the mind. That is super valid and, and, and I love the idea of exploring that. But what I hate and what I can't stand is doing this Hollywood thing of having car chases and gun battles and all in a lucid dream. It just doesn't make any sense. Why did he go there? He had a beautiful idea and he could have explored it so deeply. But instead, it just ended up being a, a series of car chases. So anyway, I'm still conflicted about that movie, um, but I know a lot of people watch it and it brings them to lucid dreaming. So for that, I appreciate it. But the movie itself, boy, they should have just stuck with the original idea and kept going. Mm. Yeah, it gets very into the psychological thriller side and maybe loses a little bit of the essence of lucid dreaming just becomes a little more of a side story in that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Can you describe in a short version your current dream journaling system and things like how you transcribe, make notes on a single dream and any methods for long-term organization, indexing, archiving that you might use now? Yeah, you know, um, I am just stuck with my same old plan, which is by my bedside, I have a nice notebook. In the middle of the night, when I have my first dream, I'll make some notes in the upper left-hand corner. When I have my second dream, I'll make some notes in the lower left-hand corner. When I have my third dream in the upper right-hand corner, I'll make some notes. Fourth dream, I'll put it in the lower right-hand corner. And I look at those little notes when I wake up in the morning and normally the dream comes back to me. Mm. So that's my system, just doing it the old fashioned way, writing it out. 
Uh, sometimes when the dream doesn't seem that pungent, I don't bother to write it out. But anyway, that's my system. I know some people have moved to audio files and all that kind of stuff, but for me, I'm an old timer when it comes to uh, keeping a dream journal. Mm, so you sort of do a shorthand version when you wake up and then you flesh it out when you wake up completely in the morning. Yeah, that's how I do it. Uh, I hate to wake up my wife, but if I have a super big lucid dream in the middle of the night, then I'll sit there and I'll be writing in the dark, but I'll write it out in greater detail so I don't lose the details. But normally just for regular dreams, make a couple notes in each of the corners, and in the morning I can read those notes and uh, recall what the dream was all about. Mm. What is your ideal nighttime routine leading up to sleep for an important lucid dream incubation night look like? Yeah, boy, if you have an important issue that you want to incubate on or have a lucid dream on, here's what I always try to do. First, I wash my sheets. I wash the bed sheets because there's actually a great feeling when you hop into a bed that has new sheets on or something. It feels more uh, inviting, more relaxing. So you want to have new sheets. Then also you want to kind of clear your mind, just, uh, you know, Whatever big stuff you have going on in your mind, tell yourself to let it go. You can imagine it being written out on a chalkboard and you just erase all that stuff, just let it all go. You really want your mind clear. And then finally, you want to really focus on your intent and you need to clarify that intent. You got to get it down to that kind of nugget form where it's exactly what you want to know. What exactly do you want to know? What's, what's the true intent? in your incubation or your lucid dream. And then when you have that, just relax and get ready for it. Have, have fun because uh, lucid dreaming can connect you with the deeper aspects of yourself and can really bring up unknown information, creative information that you never considered before. It can really rock your world. So, so that's why it pays to spend some time, clarify your intent, clear out your mind, get ready for that incubation and go with it. Mm. At this point, is it pretty automatic for you if you want a lucid dream or do you have a preferred induction technique? I know you started out with the castaneda looking at your hands kind of thing, but these days, do you have a go-to or is it pretty just if you want to do it, your your subconscious understands and you just do it? Yeah. You know, um, I consider incubation lucid dreaming light L-I-T-E, you know, just kind of like yogurt light or whatever. Um, if you really want to get the answer to a question, if you just bring it to your awareness before you go to sleep, normally you'll have a dream in which the answer will come. And so that's an easy way. So you don't have to become lucidly aware necessarily. You just have to pay attention to the dreams. And in the morning, normally you'll understand exactly the way forward. But when it comes to lucid dream induction, you know, I think really the best approach is the wake back to bed approach. If you really want to increase the likelihood of becoming lucidly aware, if you've got to have a lucid dream that night, the best thing is to wake up about two hours before you normally do, stay up for 15 minutes or whatever, thinking about lucid dreaming, go back to sleep with the intent to lucid dream, and there's about an 80% chance uh, that you'll have a lucid dream if you do this all properly. So that would be my go-to method if someone put a gun to my head and told me, you have to have a lucid dream tonight. Mm, kind of like the movie Inception. <laughs> kind of like that, but no car chase was involved. Well, yeah, hopefully your lucid <laughs> dreaming practice doesn't need to involve guns. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who is new to lucid dreaming and has either not yet had their first one or is struggling with stability and consistency issues? Yeah, wow. One thing that really surprised me is that some people do a lot of practices but never read a book. They'll read some practice online at somebody's website or they'll see some little funky YouTube that somebody did and they'll try some strange practice and they'll try it for like six months or something. And I'm thinking, what the hell? Why don't you just stop and read a book from somebody who knows what they're doing? You know, why trust some video done by some kid, you know, who's had like three lucid dreams and made a video? So what I would suggest to that person, find a book, 
Find a book that's widely acclaimed as being a good book on lucid dreaming, read it, and learn from the experience of other people. Normally you can even find these online for free if you go to some of those uh, websites that have everybody's book put up. But that's really what I'd encourage him to do because I didn't write a book on lucid dreaming until I'd been a lucid dreamer for 30 years. I really wanted to understand it at a profoundly deep level and also I wanted to share it with others so that I would help them grow as lucid dreamers too. Because one thing about lucid dreaming, it's a very mentally reflective environment. Whatever you believe gets reflected out there. And so if you have a good teacher who's given you good beliefs and good insights, then you'll do very well and you'll grow very quickly. But if you have stupid stuff from the internet that you've picked up and you don't even know what's stupid stuff because you're so new to lucid dreaming, you know, then you can really cause yourself a lot of problems by just picking up a lot of junky beliefs and lack of insights. Get a book, read it, get a magazine, read it, do something like that, and it'll really accelerate your lucid dreaming. You guys, he's being modest, but uh, Robert's books <laughs> are, uh, they're incredible. I would recommend his books as a great intro to lucid dreaming. I would think if somebody asks you between your two books, the newer one, Lucid Dreaming Plain or Simple, seems slightly more geared towards distilling things for beginners. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you know, that's what I really wanted to do. Just something that anybody could read from wherever they began, and it, it would help a beginner. But also, there's some really heavy ideas in there and some meaty stuff. Uh, e even an intermediate lucid dreamer would still uh, gain something from reading that. I, I mean, I would take that a step further. I've been holding back on that one, but I was kind of floored by the depth of that book. I think the title's almost a trick because it does have all the beginner stuff in there, but it goes really deep to as about as advanced and deep levels as you could go, at least half of it. And the other half is great stuff as well for people getting into it. But there's a lot of advanced stuff that I think even the best of lucid dreamers would appreciate just hearing the ideas that you have in there. Because there's just so much great stuff. Oh, thanks. But you know one thing, Adam? When my first book came out, I had a lot of people write me and telling me just by reading the book, they spontaneously began to have lucid dreams. And I think what was going on is that my first book just brings up so many deep questions that the person inside wants to know the answer to the questions and they begin to have lucid dreams so they can have the experience themselves. But anyway, uh, my goal is just to help people be better lucid dreamers, take it deeper than they've taken it before and see it all more clearly. So thanks for your kind comments. Yeah, yeah. And I will put on top of that, the first book, Gateway to the Inner Self, which I have right here, is an incredible book. And it really explores some of these topics like mutual lucid dreaming and precognitive dreams and uh, dreams with the deceased and all this kind of stuff, uh, types of dream figures, levels of lucidity. It goes into depth about a lot of just really good stuff. I would recommend them both highly to anybody interested in lucid dreaming. What currently excites you in the realms of lucid dream research and science? And what do you think or perhaps hope that it will look like a hundred years from now? Wow. So I'm really excited to think that someday there might be a biochemical doorway to lucid dreaming. I don't think we're there yet, but I do think that maybe someday there might be a biochemical doorway that would make it easy for people to have a lucid dream and wouldn't have any negative side effects. And so I think the fact that scientists are kind of thinking about this and people are looking at biochemistry really is an important uh, step forward for the future of lucid dreaming. But I think the other thing that has to come along someday, somebody has to explore this larger awareness, this awareness behind the dream because that really gets to the nature of the unconscious mind. When people begin to look into that and see its depth of knowledge, its creativity, its awareness, then I think that's a game changer for the universe. That's when the ego has to admit that there's something more than the ego, that there's something more going on here. And when that happens, that's when I really think we'll have kind of a new revolution 
that just like Copernicus and Galileo realized that the um, sun didn't rotate around the earth, that the earth rotated around the sun, and they finally got the relationship right. I think when we realize that there's a larger awareness, then we'll realize that everything isn't rotating around the ego, that the ego is actually part of a constellation of the self that's rotating around something much larger than itself. And we'll finally come to understand, you know, the, the truer nature of reality. But anyway, I look forward to that day because it'll truly profoundly change the world. Wow. It's a great vision. Robert, thank you so much for this deep and thought-provoking chat. I would love to do a round two sometime. There's so many other things I'd love to ask you, but for the moment, where can people find you, interact, check out your classes, etc. online? Yeah, so um, basically I have two websites. Uh, my main website is lucidadvice.com. And there you can see what kind of online workshops I'm doing or where I'm going around the world to speak at. Also, I have another website at dreaminglucid.com or luciddreammagazine.com. And that is where you can read the Lucid Dreaming Experience magazine, which is a free quarterly online magazine that my friend Lucy Gillis and I have created for the last 18 years. And you can read any of the issues for free. You can sign on. You can submit your own lucid dream or submit your own article about some issue in lucid dreaming. And we just do it to educate, inform, and inspire lucid dreamers around the world. So cool. Any final thoughts, parting words, or a message for all the dreamers out there listening, Robert? You know, I always encourage people to playfully persist. Lucid dreaming is not a straight line. You just don't put it on cruise control and go, go, go. Sometimes you're going great, then all of a sudden everything slows down. You take a detour, three months later you pick it up again. You have to playfully persist with lucid dreaming. It's just one of those skills that takes time, it takes thought, it takes insight, but it's really well worth it. And finally, it's not about the quantity of lucid dreams, it's truly about the quality of the lucid dream. And that's one reason I've written books, is to help people elevate the quality of the lucid dream. Because you can spend the entire lucid dream just playing around, having fun, lucid dream sex, whatever. And you can do that, you know, for 20 years. But if you're smart, you'll wake up and you'll realize how boring that is, and you'll begin to explore these other things and have lucid dreams of profound depth and quality. So again, not quantity, it's quality. And you just got to playfully persist. You got to keep pushing down that highway and see where lucid dreaming takes you. Mm, beautiful. Elevate your life, people. Lucid dreaming. Thank you so much, Robert. This has really been a pleasure. Hey, Adam. Thanks. Thanks. It's been a blast. I'm glad you gave me a call. Coming up. Being lucid in itself is a superpower to me. It's just magic. It's real life magic with lucid dreaming coach Lana Sackwild. I'm so surprised you know other people don't know about these things. That's something that surprises me all the time and just talking about them you know I notice the amount of people who are like wow how do you do that how do I start doing this? Next time on Is This a Dream? Thank you for listening to Is This a Dream? A lucid dreaming podcast. Each episode is written, produced, sound designed, edited, and mixed by me, Adam Cotton. All the music you hear is also written by me, except for the clip of the Dutch National Anthem. Each episode has a companion blog post with notes and links up at isthisadreampodcast.com. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on whatever app you're using. Your ratings and reviews work wonders to help the people who are surfing around find it. Also, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Until next time, dreamers, I wish you all the best in your nightly journeys. Question reality. And don't forget to enjoy the ride.
she clearly didn't want to have anything to do with me. And then she was like, well, are you a secondary projector? And I was like, what does that mean? And then I just like woke up. Wow. See, isn't that weird when a dream figure has an idea or uses a term that's kind of outside of your, I mean, you never think about secondary projectors. No, I, mean, that, I never heard of that term. Oh, how wild. In some lucid dreams, I've learned words from Latin. Mm -hmm. I've seen Spanish words that I've never heard about. And it really makes you wonder, like, what the hell? How can that be? You know, it's wild when dream figures start to put together concepts in ways that we've never thought about before. And you just realize that a lot of the creativity that we experience in the waking life you know, it might actually be these deeper parts of ourselves or even dream figures coming forward with ideas that we don't even remember from our dreaming state. One thing that I was going to mention to you and, and all is I had a funny one. Uh, a guy contacted me about four or five years ago, maybe it's longer, and he said he read my first book and, you know, lucid dreamings really meant a lot to him. And uh, he was a musician in a band. And he wanted to tell me about this bizarre experience he had. So what happened was this. He was kind of in this band that wasn't going anywhere. He was a guitarist in the band. And I think he's out in New York City or Boston area. But anyway, there was this other band that had kind of taken off and was getting a lot of traction. But then all of a sudden, their drummer died. Anyway, this one guy, one night, in a dream, he sees the deceased drummer. And he thinks, wait a second, this has to be a dream. That guy, you know, he's dead. And then he realized, oh crap, this is a lucid dream. So because he had read my first book, he goes up and talks to the guy. And this deceased drummer tells him, he goes, look, I want to tell you, you're not reaching your creative abilities because you're focused on the guitar. You're a drummer. Wow. You should begin drumming. Wow. And the lucid dreamer is thinking, you know, boy, I've never drummed, never taken any drum lessons. And, and then this drummer, who's the deceased drummer, starts to tell him, look, I'm going to tell you the secrets of drumming. He said, the secrets that I've learned from all these years of drumming. And he starts telling him about how drumming is connected to the heartbeat and he's got to connect to his heart and blah, blah, blah. And this guy is saying, it's a wild lucid dream, you know, that this deceased guy is passing on all this information. Anyway, so after they have this long conversation, the guy wakes up and he writes down his lucid dream. So the next day he's thinking, well, maybe I should, you know, go to the music store, check out the drum sets. And so he, he goes there, goes to the music store, just has his impulse to go there. And all of a sudden, through the door, walks the lead singer of this well-known group who the deceased drummer had been the drummer for. Wow. And so the lead singer comes over to him. The guy didn't even know if they'd ever met before. And they start talking. And then the lead singer says, hey, we're looking for a new drummer for our band. Why don't you come and try out? And the guy's like, well, I don't know, you know. And the guy goes, no, really, you got to come and try out. And the lucid dreamer in his mind, he's thinking, I know nothing about drums. I'll tell this guy I can come in two weeks or something, and maybe by then I'll know a little bit. And the guy goes, uh, he auditions in front of the rest of the band, and for whatever reason, they hire him on. Wow. You know, after about 10 days of drum lessons. Oh my and, God. and the guy said it was just so weird. He said not only was meeting the deceased drum figure and having him pass on all this knowledge was weird, but then in the waking state, the next day going to the music shop and having the lead singer walk in there as he's messing around over in the drum sets he just said it was totally a trippy trippy thing could barely believe it i think that just shows you know just how wild this stuff is i mean people just don't know how wild it can get yeah i mean that's an example of literally your dreams and whatever else you want to call it, just grabbing a person and being like, no, 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 this is what you got to do. And then life sort of adjusts to it. And then it just happens within a week or two, your whole life changes. It's truly wild, but it really gets to that same point. There's something going on here. And that's the beautiful thing about lucid dreaming. Because when you have an experience like that, you just can't deny it. 